Let's move to Leila. Thank you, Tanaka-san. Um, uh, well, we are on the second day of uh, the, the World Policy Conference, the end of the second day, so I will not uh, insist again on the fact that the global context has changed again over the last decade. And I think, and I have some slides actually that needs to be, that they need to be projected, but uh, thank you. Um, and, and after, I think, the very comprehensive and, and excellent uh, uh, picture that Olivier has shared with us on all the, the aspects that have changed over the last decade, I'll just focus on a couple of points, some couple of subtle trends that, are, that have been changing over the last 10 years, but not going a little bit more unnoticed than the rest. Um, should we wait for the slides, or should I just proceed? Is, is the slide coming? It's coming. But you can talk. All right. So uh, the, the first point that I wanted to mention, I mean, uh, Mr. Bakuri over lunchtime has uh, rightly pointed out that, uh, for example, PV, uh, solar PV module costs have decreased uh, uh, over time. So they have actually dropped 80% between 2010 and 2017. That's a massive drop. Uh, but I would really want to insist on another uh, cost decrease that is happening in the energy sector, which is related to storage, electricity storage. Uh, and that's, I agree, mostly driven by, by EVs, uh, bat EV batteries. But at the same time, I mean, it's quite important to mention those cost drops that we've seen in the battery, in the, including in stationary applications, the grid-scale batteries. Um, so um, electric storage storage in, in, in general have been decreasing 60 to 80 percent since 2010. Uh, and they are expected to drop by the various uh, agencies, uh, investment banks, and, uh, and researchers by an additional 50 to 60 percent by 2030. But I really want to point out the large uncertainty uh, that is prevailing in these outlooks. Large uncertainty because we don't know which technology will prevail, we don't know which chemistry is going to prevail, we don't know how much money, R&D money, it will, will, will be put uh, in, in those technologies, where the manufacturing capabilities will be, uh, will be uh, focused in, uh, or concentrated in the next few years, and of course, government support. How will government support will evolve over, over time? But I think it's fair to say that we, we can see some additional cost decreases uh, in, in energy storage as well uh, in, in, in a wider sense. The implication for me or the implication for uh, any energy player in, in, in the scene, uh, companies and countries alike, is a race. A race to gain leadership in technologies and beyond that, a race to secure access to the materials and commodities that are underlying these uh, storage technologies. And I will give uh, uh, some, some, some examples later on. The second point, the second subtle, subtle change that uh, I am seeing, at least in, in, the, in, in the energy sector over the last decade, I mean, of course, there has been an unprecedented volatility in oil prices, and, and, and it has been widely documented in press, and we all know about it, when oil prices uh, increased to $140 in 2008 before dropping to $20 to $30. And now we are in that 70 to 80 uh, uh, band uh, uh, around that. So here again, uh, we would argue, I mean, any planner would argue that this is just another commodity cycle, and, and nobody really likes uh, commodity cycles. And, and it's an uncertainty, an uncertainty that we have to live with, and I think the industry has been uh, uh, very used to live with this uh, some sort of uncertainty. But the implication of these uh, volatility is, I think, every planner's nightmare. We are today in a situation where uh, oil demand outlooks can go from, I mean, today's market of around 100 million barrels a day, to anywhere between, I mean, it can increase to 80 million barrels a day by 2040, or grow, increase to 112, 150 million barrels a day. Uh, when you are in an industry with, with huge capital investment programs, it's, 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 a, it's really a nightmare to be able to, to plan in those circumstances. So today, that gives another type of race as well, race for cost leadership, a race for prof profitability, but also a race to guarantee some sort of security of demand. And that security of demand is slightly different from the traditional definition of security of demand that we have seen over, I would say, the last two decades in, in, in the oil markets. We are 
seeing today a lot of several players investing in, uh, in uh, uh, securing demand for oil and gas in established markets. So you invest in making sure that the ICE engines uh, continue to be uh, the engines of the future for, su for sustainable transport. You continue to, to, to invest in low emission fuels uh, and in onboard CO2 capture. We see that in the heavy duty vehicles, in the shipping industry as well. We are seeing a lot of, a lot of changes happening there in those established markets. But you also see another trend in uh, a race to capture market share in new markets for, uh, for, for crude and gas. And um, I'm thinking here about, of course, petrochemicals, plastics, polymers for, for, for crude and for oil products in general and um, in trans transportation for gas. Um, and in this context, um, there will be, uh, in this, the discussion to prepare this, this panel, we talked a lot about rivalries, and I prefer to use the word uh, shifting alliances. So there will be a lot of shifting alliances. There will be a lot of, uh, I would say, proactive strategies. I prefer to use this word. Uh, but, and we should not forget that in addition to the traditional alliances that we are used to in, in, in this, again, highly capital-intensive sector, uh, the alliances today in many cases are being driven by large corporations, private corporations, but also large, increasingly large sovereign funds, uh, other national champions of new forms, uh, and national oil companies, large national oil companies, which in many cases are being perceived as competing with each other because they are pursuing similar objectives uh, and similar strategies. They all want business integration. Uh, they all want downstream investments. They all want global footprint because there's a limit to what you can achieve in your domestic market. It's, there's a limit to what you can sell in the, your domestic market, and there's, especially if you are heavily exposed to mature domestic assets. So... Um, these pro proactive strategies that I've, that I've been talking about, or those uh, shifting alliances, are driven by these three key aspects. Uh, the first one is, as I mentioned, the, the, the race uh, to secure market share by making sure that we, are, or that we continue to be low cost as much as possible. And uh, through, uh, of course, optimal extraction of resources, uh, an increasingly important capital discipline, especially after the volatility of oil prices that we have seen, um, and of, in, in addition to the, to the low cost position, uh, this would be coupled increasingly with the low carbon intensity of some operations. So you put that in a melting pot and uh, the conclusion is that, uh, uh, of course, the Russians and the Middle Eastern NOCs are very well positioned because to take advantage of their low cost position, we are talking about two to four dollars per barrel of oil equivalent uh, uh, in, for, for development and production costs. There will be a bigger challenge, of course, for Latin Americans, Asian NOCs, uh, because simply their, their, their costs are more than double that. Or for Canadian players, which are uh, disadvantaged by their, the carbon intensity of their uh, upstream operations. One word on capital discipline. I, I, I mentioned... Um, I mean, spending rates uh, in the industry have been scaled back in the wider industry by NOCs and IOCs, majors uh, all alike. Uh, and we've seen cuts in exploration budgets, which, and I will trigger, and I will talk about it a little bit later on in my conclusion, uh, it might be tr triggering another uh, commodity cycle that uh, none of us actually like in the end. Uh, but most of the national oil companies today are investing at higher rates than, than the majors. And, but in general, I think it's quite important to mention here, just a, a caveat, that apart from CNOC, uh, Petronas, and uh, Sinopec, investments of no, most national oil companies are very much focused on, on domestic projects and, and domestic markets. And this is the reason why you see now this rapprochement that uh, Olivier has mentioned between uh, the Russians, which are differentiated by, their, by the scale, by their portfolio longevity, uh, uh, and the Russians, which are now courting uh, national oil companies from the Middle East, while you have the Asian national oil companies still focusing very much in the short term on resource capture initiatives, but not any, at any price. And we have several examples in the headlines. I mean, you're all aware of uh, uh, the OPEC plus uh, alliance, uh, the rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and, 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 and Russia, uh, several investments or potential investments uh, in, in the international gas uh, industry. Uh, Qatar emerging as a major shareholder in Rosneft, that's another example, 18.95% uh, 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 in the $9 billion deal. 
because uh, the talks with uh, China, China's uh, CEFC have collapsed. So these are all examples in the headline that sort of support this uh, uh, hypothesis that I, that I presented here. Um, and since we are talking about market share, uh, I thought it was, it was quite important to say a word about the chemicals business more, more specifically. Because that, that, there's a question that, that I very often get is, why uh, is the chemical business increasingly considered in integration with, with, with refining capacity, with downstream investments? And one example is Saudi Arabia aiming to increase refining uh, capacity to 8 to 10 million barrels a day and to double the pet chem capacity by 2030. Uh, here, um, the scale of, of the investments definitely has a weight in, in the market of, of some key uh, petrochemical products, but also potentially it, it, it raises some concerns uh, around the long-term financial performance of, of, of the business. Because the issue that we are facing is that in many cases, uh, the return on capital employed of uh, a petrochemical project or a chemical project is registered single digits percentages, while the industry, as we all know, prefers to have 15% uh, returns usually. So the integration with refining becomes uh, very valuable and very important. Uh, we need uh, much more capital discipline in, in the area. And uh, in, in the basket of, of opportunities, uh, it would be also great to add some quick wins in terms of merger and acquisitions to be able to build this uh, sustainable chemicals business coupled with, uh, with, with refining. But these are the, really the only ways that, that we could see to improve the financial performance of, of, of this important business for the, for the oil industry. The upside uh, is that market access uh, to the same demand growth centers uh, targeted by oil and gas, namely China, India, Southeast Asia, etc., uh, really facilitates the building of uh, brands, the building of presence, which is much more important in the petrochemical industry. Uh, and it, it also facilitates strategic partnerships uh, with, with, uh, with, uh, with major uh, corporations in those countries. But we still need, and I think the industry is, is uh, realizing that we really need large marketing efforts, uh, large branding efforts to be able to, able, to, be able to establish a presence uh, sustainable presence in this important market for crude. Um, and the third race that I mentioned in my introduction was around the technologies and commodities. Uh, we are faced in a situation, I use the example of energy storage, uh, uh, where uh, many countries and companies are, are, are engaged in a race to secure the minerals and materials to take leadership in uh, clean, and, uh, clean and storage technologies. So for example, I mean, it was already mentioned a few times that China has been leading global investments in uh, renewable energy. We all know that. What has been less documented is that uh, the, the country has been quite aggressive in its uh, race to uh, dominate in energy storage as well. So for example, and now it's very clear, uh, by the end of 2017, the country has issued uh, a unified nationwide policy to boost the energy storage industry in the country. So to give you just some order of magnitude, the Chinese uh, industrial capacity at the end of last year was around 389 megawatt. And between in January and June of this year, so during six months of this year, uh, they put in place new uh, energy storage projects of around 340 megawatts. So we are doubling the capacity in six months. And that's across the country in, in, in various prov provinces, including Guangdong, including, including Jiangsu, etc. Uh, one word about the technologies themselves, I mean, apart from pump hydro, where uh, uh, we, we have many countries that have uh, installed them uh, over the years, uh, the three key other families, lithium ion, flow batteries, and high temperatures, they all have this large cost reduction potential that I mentioned earlier, with the caveat that it comes with a large uncertainty. Uh, so for example, lithium ion batteries for stationary applications uh, could drop uh, up to 60% 60, 60 by 2030. And that will depend a lot on, on which battery chemistry we are following. But the stationary applications, and I insist on that, have much higher costs than the EV applications because you need uh, battery management system, systems, you need more hardware for the stationary applications. But they are benefiting, of course, from the growth in the EV industry. 
And uh, the flow batteries, and these are my, my personal favorites, uh, uh, not only because of the beautiful colors that we see in a vanadium flow battery, uh, these uh, batteries can actually drop, their cost can actually drop two-thirds between now and 2030. Here again, a uh, huge uncertainty, but the beauty of flow batteries and that is that they are independ independently scalable and, uh, so, and the, the power and energy storage capacity characteristics make them very much scalable and modulable, uh, which makes them very well applicable for, uh, for uh, grid-scale solutions. But all this, all this rosy picture of cost decreases comes at a price, and the price that I wanted to highlight here is the minerals that uh, uh, and, and uh, commodities that uh, are on which these technologies are dependent on. So the issue that we have today is that this, all the technologies, uh, all the uh, technologies around uh, energy storage, revolves around just a few key commodities. Um, we we have the NMC, the nickel, manganese, cobalt. We have copper, lithium, of course, graphite, zinc, and now increasingly vanadium. Copper and nickel are already key industrial materials, uh, key industrial metals which are traded on commodities, commodities exchanges and consumers are very much uh, used to uh, managing supply risks. Uh, manganese and graphite supplies are available in sufficient quantities, but the issue now is really around cobalt, and you see in my slide uh, the price vol volatility uh, in, in cobalt and lithium, uh, because these, there are major concerns, as we, as we know, uh, around uh, security of supply for those uh, two commodities. And, and, and cobalt primarily is driving some countries' strategies, including China, and China's uh, aggressive investments in uh, uh, DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, where 60% of supplies of cobalt are, are, are concentrated, uh, uh, is quite key there. But it comes, uh, as we know, with political instability, with uh, conflicts over mineral issues, etc. So even if we, the industries and uh, the industry and the uh, the research and development in the energy storage is trying as much as possible to reduce its dependence towards cobalt and, and other uh, key commodities there by switching to uh, less cobalt-rich cathodes on, or trying other, uh, other alternatives. <laughs> The, 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 the five leading lithium-ion ba battery uh, manufacturers that Mr. Carlos Ghosn has referred to uh, are definitely de still dependent a lot on cobalt supplies. So, um, in conclusion, uh, we talked about the U.S., Russia, Middle East, China, a little bit about the, the, the EU as well. I mean, of course, there, are a lot of, there is a lot of repositioning and alliances and change in alliances in, in today's world. But I think it's quite important to mention that there is still a continuous uh, emphasis and a continuous focus on the key fundamentals, which is growth, profitability, and increasingly trying to have a proactive technology strategy because uh, th that's really a must for the future. One key area that has been neglected so far, and, uh, and, and I would like to, to, to finish on that, is really system flexibility, more than, more than, much more than system security, actually. And, uh, and I see that, and I've been an advocate, actually, myself, of, of the LNG industry as well, because uh, it's bringing liquefied gas from the other side of the world, uh, frozen at minus 162 degrees Celsius, minus 260 degrees Fahrenheit, is a beautiful uh, technical challenge. It's a beautiful commercial challenge. Uh, but it does not necessarily answer uh, the, the, the issue of system flexibility, simply because the market mechanisms that, that we have today are not mature enough to reward system flexibility. Uh, we still have pricing mismatch, we still have arbitrage. Uh, that the, the traders and the industry is, 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 is taking advantage of, and we still have market inefficiencies that hampers uh, uh, energy system flexibility to be properly rewarded. So ideally, we want to have more tradability, more connectivity between between regions, between neighboring countries, and with global markets. And that, then there's no secret there. We need more investments in infrastructure, in midstream and downstream infrastructure for that. So that's why I, I focused, surprisingly, most of my presentation on, on storage, because there is a growing awareness in the industry, whether we like it or not, that energy storage is, is of incredible and paramount importance. Uh, because we, I mean, in, in the country where I'm based, there is a large swing of demand, for example. You see in many other countries a massive introduction of renewable uh, energy uh, and in many cases this questions the large capital investment programs 
in the oil and gas part of the industry. And that creates another commodity cycle, another cycle of volatility that is definitely not in the interest of the producers and not in the interest, interest of the consumers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Leila. Very good presentation. Um, one point, I, I want to ask you that uh, I agree, agree with uh, many of the points you uh, raised. Uh, for example, the industrial use of uh, gas and oil will increase rather than fuel. Um, uh, the future of the gas, for example, it's not the fuel for the power generation. It's going to be the petrochemical as an input. So, uh, and also, I understand that for the storage, is Saudi Aramco serious about using hydrogen as a possible way of storage of the clean source of hydrocarbon, I mean, I mean uh, non-carbon non uh, fuel? Uh, I talked with uh, some of uh, the CTO of Saudi Aramco that uh, taking out the carbon dioxide and put underground as an enhanced oil recovery uh, is a capture and storage. So the hydrogen becomes the clean source. So by doing so, uh, exporting clean oil as hydrogen is one of the technological options for Saudi Aramco. Is, is, are you seriously thinking of this option? Um. Uh, here, I'm, I am not speaking in my, in my capacity as, uh, as Saudi Ramco okay, here, so I, I, will not, I will not make a comment on that. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, I can only comment on what the industry is doing uh, on that, and, and there, are, there are many, many initiatives. O OGCI is one of them, uh, and I think a lot of the players in the industry are, are quite serious in, in investing as much as possible, as, as I mentioned earlier, to reduce, uh, to, to try to uh, preserve uh, market share in, in established market as, as, as much as possible, uh, uh, and, and including capturing CO2 in, in multiple applications. That's, that's all what I can say okay, on that. Okay. Thank you very much.